So thanks for doing this. Um, it, it'd be good if we could perhaps start with just putting it into context, I think, about what the background and 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 how things were back in back in 69. Well, a little bit of understanding was it was it illegal to be gay in the US at that time? Um, what the profile of gay people were like and and apart from Stonewall, how many other bars were were um, raided, et cetera. So just give us a little bit of general context, sure. if you would. Yeah, uh, well, prior to Stonewall, I, I had been in a, in a bar that had been raided. And the, 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 the common practice back then with the police uh, was to take the people that were violating the law, having to do with uh, having to have a minimum number of items of clothing that identified you as male or female or, or whatever. And uh, so what they would do is they would line you up in the bar. I was in an after hours place that was around the corner from where I lived and, and uh, they would line you up against the wall, look at you and they would say, okay, you over here, the people that were gonna be arrested, you people, you leave. And so I was among the people that left because I didn't do drag or, or anything like that. Mm. Uh, and uh, that that was normally what you would experience in a, in a bar raid. Stonewall was different because some of the people uh, began to fight inside. Uh, and in my research, I was able to find out who some of these people were. And uh, I, I didn't find that uh, the few people that consider themselves later to be trans had really done anything remarkable. One person that's in the same uh, uh, program, or the, uh, are you familiar with um, Stonewall Uprising? No, yeah. I'm not. Okay. It's a Peabody Award winning documentary that was mm -hmm. done by um, uh, Kate Davis and, and her husband. Okay. Uh, and and uh, it, they, they gathered a group of people that had been associated with the Stonewall situation and um, interviewed them for it. And one of the people that they interviewed was a trans, today a trans woman, mm -hmm. who uh, in fact did nothing more than get herself punched out by a cop because he had had a, a lot of experience in jails and knew that the best way to get out of the situation was to get knocked out. Mm -hmm. And that would be the end of the beating that he was going to get. Uh, so, you know, th th this wasn't leadership so much as preservation. Mm -hmm. And th th those of us that were on the outside that started the riot, uh, we approached it much, much differently. We, we wanted to be in the situation. We wanted to be a part of it. We wanted to carry it on to the next steps. Mm -hmm. So you were actually looking at that point to, to make a stand. This was, was it, was yeah. it planned or yeah. has, did it just- No, it, it wasn't planned. Uh, I, was, I was out that night with my partner, Craig Rodwell, who yeah. is much better known than me. And uh, Craig had, he was really a pioneer at that time. Mm -hmm. And a close associate of people like Barbara Giddings, uh, Frank Kameny, um, Dick Leitch. Dick Leitch, he didn't have a very good relationship with, but that's another very long story. Uh, but he and I, we happened upon the, the raid just as they were bringing people out of the bar. Mm -hmm. And uh, Craig was the person that started yelling gay power. Right. And, you know, people took up that chant. And, and uh, when Stormy Delarave, who's a lesbian that was being arrested, uh, yelled out to us, why don't you guys do something? That's uh -huh. when the riot really kicked off. Right. So it was more at a right place, right time, that people were right. ready to actually just make a stand and had had enough at that point. Yeah, and and what brought me into all of this was uh, in, in 2019, I had been invited to go to Paris for um, uh, an event that was being held by the uh, Association de Journalistes uh, LGBTQI mm. in, in France. And uh, they were 
they were interested in the fact that I'm a French American and had this connection to Stonewall. So they very nicely, kindly invited me to their event. And I went there and, and prior to that, I was one of those people, one of those men who, um, you know, I'd heard about trans being associated with the gay movement, but didn't think much more of it other than, oh, that's nice. We're helping out some other people and, and mm. you know, I'm for that. Uh, but when I, when I attended the event and the different uh, things that were held in conjunction with it, I started to hear a story that I did not recognize about right. Stonewall, about the, the gay liberation movement. And uh, that's, that's what started me looking into it more. Mm -hmm. So I spent the summer reading, I, I bought books, I did my research, you know, I'm an old cop and, and you, you look into things first before you mm -hmm. open your mouth and mm -hmm. you try to understand what's been going on. And what I found, I found very disturbing the, the, the transgender aspect of the, the, the movement had taken over the movement um, I found it to be deeply homophobic mm -hmm. as well as misogynistic. And it, it's really the, the gay liberation movement has been taken over by a number of straight people. Yeah. And uh, who have a fetish that, that, you know, fine for them, but has really nothing to do with the gay rights movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This kind of leads me to the question, which is around Marsha. Um, you know, the, the view is that Marsha was the person who um, was there at the time who, who threw the first brick, as it's been quoted as, and that she was a, they say she was a trans woman where, where other people who are, are, have been there at the same time as him say he was, identified himself as a, as a, as a transvestite. Um, That's right. What is your view on that? And what's your recollection, Fred? Well, Malcolm Michaels, which is his name, Junior, uh, he, uh, he was a transvestite. Um, he was very flamboyant. He was a sex worker. He was a drug addict. And these, that, that combination of, of features is not what the gay community then looked to for leadership. I know they've been lionized today as somehow providing that leadership back then, but they truly provided nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were troublesome. Uh, first, they went into the gay liberation front, <clears throat> which we weren't a part of, but who we associated with. Uh, and they were considered to be pests. Uh, Malcolm Michaels, Marsha Johnson, uh, Sylvia Ray Rivera, the, the entire group of them formed a, what was called then a cell within GLF. Right. And it was made up of transvestites. And uh, they were troublesome in meetings. This went on for so long that by 1973, they were actually uh, thrown out of, of pride because of their antics, because of their grifting, because of everything centered around them as opposed to a movement. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And and what was the effect? Or what was it like immediately after after that event? Did things get worse for the gay community? Did there were obviously the profile of the gay community went through the roof in terms of the media? But what yeah, what was the feeling well, within the community, and and how did it change things immediately afterwards? Well, in terms of media, there was a change. Uh, we had to do a little bit more work to get better coverage. Uh, we had a demonstration uh, that we uh, worked on with GLF uh, at the Time Life Building. They had written an article. It was a cover story actually for uh, Time Magazine back in October. Um, I don't know whether it was a joke or not, but they did it on Halloween. Uh, but we protested a week later at the Time Life Building, uh, specifically to criticize their coverage, their, their stereotyping of gay people, as opposed to doing real coverage of what the movement was about. 
they right. were trying to to cover what had happened over the course of the summer, but they did it in, in a typically um, uh, disparaging way that, that that was common in the media back then in the U.S. I so would... we demonstrated, and by April of the following year, they did change their coverage. They 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 dropped some of the the terms that they were using, uh, and you know it was part of the progress of mm -hmm. of. Uh, improving media coverage. And was homosexuality still or illegal in the US at this point? Yes. Yeah, it was, okay. Yeah, very much so, yeah. So that kind of coverage in the media was unheard of at this point or any sort of positive coverage in the media was really important for the movement at that point? Yeah, the, 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 the piece that they published in April of 1970, which was prior to the first Pride March, you know, they were getting their coverage together then, uh, had a more neutral feel to it. it wasn't perfect, but it was a, a, an improvement over what we've been experiencing in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first Pride March in 70 took place when homosexuality again was still illegal in the US. That's right. Okay. Because that's, that's quite distinct from the UK situation. Um, at the time. Um, yeah. I see. And obviously those, ev those events, you've got a very good understanding of those events and a very good understanding of the history. How does it, how do you feel about the revisionism? How do you, how do you, how does you, you feel it affects the, today's living experience of, of, of gay men and women? Gay men well, and this was part of why I um, kind of came out of retirement uh, in 2019. In, in fact, my going on to Twitter um, was at the same time that J.K. Rowling made her by now famous statements. And uh, we, we kind of landed at the same time. And interestingly, she started following me on Twitter and I was liking her comments and that sort of stuff. And uh, Pink News got very put out about the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I, I discovered you around that sort of time as well in 2019, because that's when I was just starting to get active on Twitter in this particular yeah. space as yeah. well. Is that when you first noticed it, Fred, or did you notice the build up prior to that and when you went, when you got invited to Paris? So had you seen this revisionism starting to build over a period? I, I had noted something before, but it was after Paris that I... I realized how pernicious it all was and what was being done with this revisionist history. Uh, a, a good example of the kind of thing I've been doing is uh, right now there's a, a fellow on, on Twitter who calls himself a um, LGBTQ plus XYZ historian. Okay. And he, he um, his name is Tyler Alberterio. You may want to leave that in or cut it out. And how old is he, Fred? Uh, he's he's going to be thirty in um, oh, okay. July, and he he has a view of gay history that's in service to the gender community, okay. uh, which he's trying to promote through his Twitter account. So I've been trying to combat that a little bit on Facebook. Uh, some of what I do is is uh, a little tongue in cheek, but as one person said, I, I can be a little harsh at times too. And this this fella is causing damage because young people in, who are interested in, in LGBTQ history are listening to him as though he has something important to say. Uh, formerly, he had done a little research work for a, a group that you may or may not have heard of called Making Gay History. It's, it's something that Eric Marcus has, has done here in the US. And th they've done very good work. Eric ha has a podcast. Uh, he has recordings of people. Right, um, why do you think they need to oh, be so revisionist? Well, what do you think is the, they, they feel the impact is of that? I beg your pardon? What do you feel that the why do you feel you do you think they need 
to have this revision this revisionist approach what do you think that they feel that they're going to get how well, are they going to make an impact that was the example i was going to give you this this past week he did a walking tour on his twitter account of the village area and he talked about what happened at stonewall mm -hmm. and he without any evidence without a source he said that craig had his, hadn't really participated in the riot although that's quite untrue uh, but had merely observed it and had done so from a distance on grove street which is across christopher park from the stonewall yeah that's not where we were at all. In fact, we were walking home and Grove Street was not the way we would have gone to go home. Um, and he, he posted a picture on there of what Craig likely saw. All very interesting, all very well done, but total nonsense. Uh, so I dug up a picture, I contacted Eric Marcus at Making Gay History, and I showed him a picture of what Christopher Park looked like uh, during the uh, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Mm. And it shows the shrubbery that grew in the park. And based on that photograph alone, there's no way in the world that Craig could have seen what was going on at the stone wall if he was where Tyler Arabotario said he was. Okay. Because there was just too much shrubbery in the park at the time. Mm. It, it, in fact, the shrubbery was cut down in the early 70s because that's where the sex workers, the hustlers, used to take their tricks right. at night into the yeah. park, hide in the shrubs. So, you know, it, it's, it's like a constant effort to try to keep the truth out there and to try to use real sources yeah. in the process. The sources that are, are being ignored by the, the revisions. So that, do you think this, this revisionist history is actually gaining traction um, more widely now that it's it would be that's what people would hear if they start to look for gay history or taught gay history in in schools they would be starting to get this revisionist version. oh yeah yeah that's very much the intent is to change the history yeah and so it, it's it's a constant onslaught and you know there are only so many of us left that were there at that time that mm. can speak up. and i'm probably the mouthiest of them all so <laughs> do you think there is there's, there's a clear political function here um, for this revised narrative uh, to almost strip gay people of their history. It, it, precisely. Robbing them the, of their history. The, the, the history of the gen, gender movement in the future will be that of appropriation. People will recognize that that's what occurred because people who were there are still able to say that didn't happen. Yeah. And what impact do you think that's having on gay people, particularly young gay people who are looking, looking for some legacy and looking for some leadership? What, what, what if, how negative do you think that is and what do you think is the best way of counteracting that, apart from what you're doing, of course? One of the ways to counteract it is to explain to young people today that they are actually the target of the gender movement. They, they are the people that are being converted to the gender movement. Um, a, a, as we well know, people are detransitioning because that's not who they really are. They've been sold a bill of goods. And as they real, realize that, whether it's Carabelle or some kid down the street that, that nobody knows, mm -hmm. they're all finding out that they've been tricked. Yeah. Yeah, and they've been they've been fed a falsehood, which is based upon a falsehood. That's right. That's precisely it. Yeah. So uh, the second part of that question was, how do you think we, apart from what you're doing, how do we best combat this disinformation and propaganda? How how can we we as gay men be more more uh, the most effective? At, at, at combating this? Well, first, to stick to the truth. Mm -hmm. And then to remember that what they've done isn't something that happened yesterday or last year. 
Uh, it's been an ongoing effort that was started primarily by two transgender attorneys in the US back in the early 90s. And they, they laid out their plan back then as to how to go about, uh, although they didn't say it this way, how to go about taking over a movement so that they could piggyback on mm -hmm. the good results of, of what we had done. Yeah, yeah. And obviously the importance of gay history is of vital importance to gay people and to gay men and, and lesbians because it gives them a legacy. And so effectively by taking that legacy away, you, you're taking away the foundations for young gay youth to actually say, this is who I belong to. So you're making them effectively the gender movement and making them rudderless. Would you, would, would you agree with that? Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, but again, once uh, young uh, lesbian and gay people get involved into this, uh, they embrace it. And it's after they've been involved for a period of time, they realize it really isn't true to them. It really isn't who they are. Uh, they are gay, they are lesbian. And that, that becomes clear, but not at an insignificant cost. Um, it's something that they'll be dealing with for the rest of their lives. Mm. That, that's what I find so concerning that that the, the, the damage that's being done today is, is being done to a generation. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's being done at an institutional level as well, because there was a, I think there was a video not long ago by a school teacher in the States who, who stated that the pink triangle was a symbol of asexual people. Um, Back, in, back during the, the, the Nazi regime. And right. it seems that these are the type of, of lies that we, we have to counteract. Right, it's a, it's a constant effort. And, and the one thing I try to do when I'm speaking about things in whatever way is I try not to lose track of, of where I am because that's what their effort has been built upon, having people lose track. Mm. You can't always respond to them directly. You you just have to keep making your statement over and over again. So what do you mean yeah. by losing track of where you are? I, I beg your pardon? What do you mean by losing track of where you are? Uh, I, I think people in, in I think people get a little too focused on the problems of of transgender people. Um that's important, of course, but not to our discussion. Mm -hmm. Our discussion is about us, and right. we need to keep it focused on us yeah. and not get drawn into trying to find a way to fix this for transgender people. Right. We just really need to say enough is enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and perhaps the, the next subject would be good to discuss is what happened on Twitter? Oh, <laughs> well, generally I try to be as polite as I possibly can on Twitter. I'm not always successful. Right. And, uh, Neither, none of us are. <laughs> yeah. But we all slip up occasionally. Yeah. What I try to say to people, well, you know, before you can properly insult somebody, you have to know some good manners yourself. So I, that's the way I always try to approach it but I'm not above losing my temper with people. And uh, when, when somebody is just flat out lying about an exchange that we're ha having, I, I'm apt to say, fuck off. Okay. And that gets me in trouble on, in, on Twitter. But it gets, it gets our side of the argument in trouble, but it doesn't seem to get the other side of the argument in trouble. Rarely, rarely. In fact, I, prior to my suspension, I had gotten a previous suspension, and that was because I was in a in a discussion with a group uh, as a result of a comment that I had made on Twitter mm -hmm. that people were apoplectic over. I had said that I supported Joe Biden's 
lifting of the ban against transgender people in the military. And it's for a very simple reason. I've always been a civil rights advocate and I've never found governmental discrimination to be a solution to anything. Mm -hmm. So I oppose it even when you're talking about transgender people. I don't think the path to uh, remedy is going to be through governmental discrimination. So that's why I made the statement that I did. Well, the next thing I knew, I had a, a dozen people piling on to me, asking me the standalone question and, you know, trying to make paint me to be mm -hmm. a bad guy in the situation. And I finally told them all to go fuck themselves. And that got me suspended. Okay. And um, did you... They were just representing what I said. Right. And when was this, Fred? Uh, this was, I guess, back in February of last year. And then the following month, I got suspended uh, when I had a, a, a run-in with a British politician or a would-be politician. He's not been successful. Uh, his name is Ali Yu. Whether you need that or not is, is fine. But uh, he was using his Twitter account as, as his campaign account. Mm -hmm. And so I took it with the fact that he was using he, she pronouns. And I said that that was lunacy. Well, that that's when the pylon began. Right. And that's when I got suspended. I, I, I should point out, though, that he was in a nine person race and he came in a distant ninth. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's sweet so justice. For now, from <laughs> okay. I OK. Have you tried? Have you appealed since the the new regime has started to have an effect? Yeah, I, I appealed immediately. I let a month go by be, before I thought things might have cooled down a bit. Appealed again; it was denied again. So I've appealed now probably a half a dozen times. My most recent appeal I've sent to their safety office in in San Francisco and. Uh, Dennis Cavanaugh was kind enough to help with that. So yes, right. uh, instead of my usual 100 word appeal, it became a 15 page appeal. <laughs> yeah, the, the, that's Dennis Cavanaugh for you, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. Have you got anything else, Hassan, that you, you think we should cover? Um, well, I don't think so. I think we've, we've covered quite a bit. Uh, yeah. And I guess the one of the final questions on um, that we were, we were looking at was just a discussion of what the importance of gay history is to gay people um, and what it means to be losing that uh, through the revisionism. Well, without knowing our history, and, and, and I'm amazed at how ignorant people can be at times, it's not like there aren't a couple of hundred books that yeah. they could go to. and and learn, you know, things that have been sourced properly and, and, and such. Uh, without, without knowing our history, we're, we're gonna go nowhere and we're going to be forgotten and we're going to end up as part of the gender uh, movement. Mm. And, and, and do you feel that younger people feel that the rights that you fought for and and the people around you fought for, and, and perhaps people in the, the, the younger generation below you. Do, do you feel the young people feel that those rights have always been there as a matter of fact? Uh, that, that's, that's quite possible that, that they've come around to that way of thinking. But I think they're going to have to have their own experience. Uh, you know, the, your history can only tell you so much. It's what you experience yourself that, that that drives what you end up believing and doing. And, and they're going to have to come, they're gonna to have to come to a re realization here in, in what's going to be a hard way. They're going to have to fight back to regain some of what they've lost. And that's gonna be their fight, not my fight. Yeah. You know, I'm not gonna be uh, here for that fight. And as an elder statesman, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to call you that. But as an elder statesman, do you see the the rise in homophobia become accelerating as a result of what we we've, we've discussed? 
I don't know if I would say accelerating so much as being reinforced. It, okay. it, it's something in order to, to be a homophobe, you've got to have some backing in it. And, and that's what they're getting out of this. Uh, in a way, they, they observe the homophobia of the general movement and they say to themselves, see, I've been right all along. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. An act of reinforcement of yep. existing homophobia that's never really gone away. That's right. Yeah. Any more than racism goes away or, uh, you know, the disparagement of different beliefs, whether they be, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, Jewish or Muslim or Christian or whatever. Uh, people are entitled to their beliefs. I don't happen to share any of those, mm -hmm. but um, I, I do support their right to yeah. have their beliefs. Yeah. So we've dropped our guard once, but we're not going to drop it again. Exactly. I think I think there's a lesson to be learned here for the the lesbian and gay community, uh, and, and it's it's going to take because they're not going to be able to handle much more of this of our being stuffed back into the bottle. Yeah. Okay. That's right. That's really powerful stuff to think about, and um, I think we got a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of material there that we will make everybody who is who cares about our community think well, I, very deeply. I'd, wanna, I'd really want to end on this note that that I'm an I'm an optimist, and I see a lot of people in the movement today that I think are more than capable of carrying the ball on this mm -hmm. and coming out with a good result, and. So, I'd like to leave it with that. Okay, that's okay. great. Fred, Fred okay. Sargent, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. For you everything you've done over the years, not just for this. Well, thank you for asking me. I, I appreciate it. My pleasure. And we'll look, as soon as we've got the, the recording ready and the video, we'll, we'll give you a pre-sneak a pre -sneak of it. Okay, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Fred, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, guys. I, Let me see I, if I, I can figure out how to turn this off now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Hassan will do that for you. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. Bye.